getting red-pilled on the Pope over the past five years. Many people initially had some misgivings about Pope Francis or some of his statements, but as time has gone on, as Amoris Laetitia came out and the dubia, and moving into the American Catholic abuse crisis, more and more people are saying, you know what, there's something wrong in this pontificate. Today we're talking about being red-pilled on Pope Francis, a reference to the Matrix, taking the red bill and seeing reality for what it is. Tim Gordon's with us, and also Patrick Coffin of Coffin Nation, former host of Catholic Answers Live, the author of The Contraception Deception, appropriate for the 50th anniversary of Humanae Vitae. Patrick Coffin, welcome. Thanks you. Uh, thanks you, and thanks to you, sir. <laughs> That's how the Canadians say it. Too much wit to uh, too small space. T. Marsh and T. Gord, great to be with you guys. Yes, again. absolutely. So we've already spoken about our kind of progress on getting red-pilled, uh, taking the red pill and making that uncomfortable, uh, it's not really a decision, but uh, I guess having the epiphany that the leadership in the Catholic Church, not just locally in the USCCB, but in the Cardinals and even in the Holy See with Holy Father Pope Francis, that we have some bad things, some confusing things, and it's no longer acceptable just to stand aside and pray and be quiet. We have to actually say something. Priests, bishops, but even the lady should get involved and say, hey, something is not right here. We don't like what we see, and we want something to change. So in your experience over the past five years, were you one of the people day one, or has this been something more recent where you say, you know, there's something not right here? Uh, Taylor, I have tried to retrofit how my red pill consumption went down <laughs> okay. uh, like, like a spoonful of, uh, you know, baked sugar. I've been wincing my way through this papacy. I would say the first two years I was, I was in full Pope's plane mode. He would say yeah. something a little off or kind of hard to understand. And I would say, well, look, I mean, I was on Catholic answers live. So I, my job was to explain and defend the faith. Well, this became a problem because when we would get asked questions about whether it's who might have judged him or um, I'm trying to think of some of the earlier ones, uh, his, his habit of insulting his enemies sort of passive aggressively through, uh, uh, you know, ad hominem uh, attacks uh, in, the, in his morning homilies, uh, interviews at 35,000 feet. And after a while, now I understand the Pope explaining uh, motive because you want to, you want your popes to be winners. You want to back a strong thoroughbred. And so we've had, you know, 25 years of St. John Paul II with his rich uh, spiritual depth. Then we have the German precision of Joseph Ratzinger as Pope Benedict. And then we have uh, an emotional uh, kind of um, lots of exclamation marks in his, in his, uh, even in his documents. And we just finally, I felt like we get the Pope we deserve all of a sudden. And, and part of that motivation of wanting to Pope's plane is because you want to cover the nakedness of your father, right? Like Noah's sons, your father's drunk, he's exposed. So, so protect his dignity. But after a while, Taylor, honestly, I felt like if my father's not just drunk and naked, it's an alcoholic streaker. <laughs> and that's what I do. How, do. how do you deal with that? And so my red pill came, I think the, the thing where I, I really, I just stopped doing it was his flight uh, back from Rio World Youth Day, because if you remember on the flight from Rome to, to Rio for that World Youth Day meeting, he actually says, I don't do interviews. I don't like journalism uh, tactics very much. They give me a headache, so I don't do interviews. I never did them when I was the Archbishop of Buenos Aires. And then on the way back, we get who am I to judge him, which is a reference to um, Monsignor Rica, right, who's right. now the eye of the Vatican Bank who himself has been the subject of homosexual scandals right across the river there in, in Uruguay. <clears throat> and I thought, I can't unring this bell. And so that was a big turning point for me, that I stopped defending him and stopped blaming the New York Times and CNN and MSN. <clears throat> because this is an interesting, I'll stop here. With, with previous pontiffs, and I've lived through six of them, they gathered huge crowds, no matter how old the Pope was, no matter how seemingly irrelevant from a worldly point of view. John Paul II, in the middle of World Youth Day, commanded the largest live audience in human history, like 5 million. He was 81 or 82 at the time. And the press hated his guts out, right? 
He was the authoritative, arch-conservative, woman-hating pole who would never change. But with Francis, it's almost reversed. The press love him. He was on the cover of the of Advocate magazine, the homosexual publication. He's just their mascot. He's the subject of the most worldly adulation I've ever seen. But his crowds are quite small. I was in Rome a few months ago, and the general audience, let's just say it was not, not the number swell that I had seen with the two previous pontiffs. So that's a compressed version of my red pill. When you, when you made that point to uh, Ross Duthit, when you interviewed him, Pat, he, he pointed out, uh, he, he, he kind of defended his ribs a little bit on Pope Francis, even though he's a critic, by saying, well, that, that's subjective, you know, that the crowds can swell and whatnot. I, I thought it was a good point you made with him. But um, it, yeah, so the, there's, there's one thing that I, I think uh, pe- people might say, oh, well, how are we, are we measuring by the crowds? What are the objective measures? The first, I think it was three weeks into the the papacy, was when I received my first major whiff of of stink, and and it was this. It might have been two weeks in. He said that we're talking too much about abortion, right? Which is a little bit like telling Mark Twain that in 1859 we're talking too much about slavery. Yeah. How, how how is it ever possible? to talk too much about a thing that's not uh, about a, you know, huge public sin, the leading public sin that's not yet undone. Right. So I, I, I figured to myself, I don't know if I'm being over simplistic, but I didn't like to hear, I remember where I was driving. I was thinking about this as I turned into my neighborhood yesterday, I was listening to a local conservative kind of Protestant redneck guy, redneck and owning it guy here in Bakersfield. Um, making a left into my neighborhood when he was elected. And I was thinking about this show and I thought he was a Jesuit and, and the, the guy, the local guy, Jazz McKay here, he didn't know what that meant. And I thought, uh Oh, I heard South America. I'm not going to lie. I, I heard, Oh, this, this could be a, uh, this could be a demographical ploy. Of course, I didn't know yet then about the Sun Gallen mafia or any of that stuff. None of us did. Right. But you know, uh, and then I, I heard a couple other things and I said, I'm going to keep an eye on this. And I remember two, three weeks in, I don't like it when I'm hearing the abortion. Is there ever a, a, a reason? It's a rhetorical question, of course, to say that we're, we're not we're talking too much about abortion. I knew right there something was wrong. Yeah, you're bringing me back to a similar sense that I had every every mention of abortion or contraception or any of the so-called pelvic issues. That's I mean, that's what our enemies call them, pelvic issues. I felt mm-hmm. like talking to me like I'm the object of his criticism. I have never I have never heard a contraception based homily. Not one time. I've never heard a single homily about homosexual behavior. Once in a while, there'll be a reference to abortion. And, uh, you know, praise God for brave priests who tackle it. And I thought, did his experience in South America involve nonstop harping on these things to the exclusion of all else? I, I didn't know the answer. it. But back to back to subjectivity versus objectivity. Crowd sizes are objective because they're about math. And when the faithful know that the vicar of Christ is in their town, they show up in, in full. Look at the Google images of Phoenix Park in 1979 when John Paul II went to Ireland. Like half of Ireland is it's humanity to the horizon. And con- contrast that with the world meeting of LGTB, excuse me, the world meeting of families in Dublin. Uh, it's Freudian. Yeah. noticeably very, very, very much smaller. So it's, you know, it's yeah. one. Uh, so one subjective thing, I hear a lot of people saying this, you know, when he came out onto the loggia and he raised his hand in a strange way and he said, Buena sera, I felt really weird. Well, that's subjective. I mean, you might be projecting somewhat there. So I agree. There's a certain subjective subjectivity ploy, uh, play there. Yeah. I have some, some good data. I mean, I was there from in June 2015, June 16, June 17. So same time period, same place. And Every Wednesday was right there at the audiences. And I can tell you a fact from 15 to 16, the crowd was down from 16 to 17. The crowd was down consistently week after week. So it's, it is true math as Patrick says, Um, you know, I, for me going back, I was, as you guys were talking about what were the triggers uh, I was triggered 
when um, I was defending him like Patrick, you know, and I crossed swords with Ferrate Chaley and, you know, a lot of trad groups, even though I do attend the Latin Mass, I was like, hey, we got to give this guy a chance. He is the Holy Father. We cannot throw him under the bus. This is, as Catholics, we cannot do this. So I was defending him. But along the way, I was like, oh, man, this is a hard one. You know, how many times can we say uh, there was a transli- translation issue or it was taken out of context or, well, it's just the New York Times, so you can't trust it. You know, like how many dozens of times that I have to say that. But for me, it was the statement on, uh, he was talking about a woman, I think she had eight children or seven children. Do you remember? Yeah, I yeah. do. Yeah, yes. Cesarean. Yes. Abbott comment. Yeah, and he says, you yeah. know, we as Catholics are not supposed to breed right, uh, breed like rabbits. And I think my wife and I were expecting baby number eight. And I was like, gee, thanks, Holy Father. You know, like, yeah. I'm a rabbit. You know, I even put a, a picture up on... Uh, on the, at that point, I was like, okay, today is the day that I'm not going to go against him, but I'm going silent. I'm no longer going to go up on my blog and try to spin what he says and make it orthodox, make it true, make it pious. From now on, he's on his own. I'm not, I'm not coming to anybody's rescue anymore. And then when Amoris Letizia comes out, I'm scratching my head saying, how, how is this even possible to reconcile? And then when, but I felt alone. And then when the Dubia brothers came out, and I think that was fall of 16. It was fall. Yeah. Because yeah, uh, at that point, I was like, okay, that's it. That's it. I'm done. It, it was, was right re- before It was right before Thanksgiving of fall. So it, it's okay. almost, we just passed the two-year mark. Yeah. Dubia brothers. Yeah. And what's sad is, is, you know, in America, you know, we've all heard whispers and gossip and even in the newspaper of homosexual priests, uh, pedophilia, uh, pederasty, all these things. And we thought, well, we're going to get that cleaned up. But the, with the McCarrick thing, we've realized, no, it's not just with the priests or the monsignors or the seminary rectors or the bishops or the archbishops. It's all the way to the cardinals. And it's been actively covered up going all the way to Rome. And we see the Pope is also <clears throat> surrounded by, by men who have been compromised. Yeah. Yeah. That's, we can say it goes, uh, it goes above the cardinals. Yeah. Uh, you can see a lot, you can, you can gauge someone's worldview by their hiring and firing their executive decisions. And when my friend, uh, Raymond Cardinal Burke, who I've met a couple of times, interviewed him a dozen times through the years, when he was unceremoniously demoted as prefect of the, the apostolic signature, I thought that's a very strange thing. He went from the second highest position in a law and church to uh, the Knights of Malta chaplain, almost like a Boy Scout, you know, patron thing. And yeah. very, very strange. And then Walter Casper rising uh, out of, you know, 1970s uh, beige Catholicism. He's brought back in. And a big trigger for me, uh, Taylor and Tim, was the sight of Godfrey Daniels on that loggia directly behind the Holy Father. This is a man who oversaw the destruction of the Catholic Church in Belgium over 30 years. His uh, positions on not only same-sex marriage, but on on the pro-choice rhetoric, um, euthanasia. Uh, someone who's who's personally admired, I don't want to get into Daniels, but his public record is shameful. And he was brought back in as some kind of figurehead or, uh, you know, Eminem's Grease that we're supposed to look up to. Uh, that it's was- only... It's only shameful if you don't like Freemasonry or abortion or homosexuality as a, just a joke. Yeah. yeah. Depends what your point of view is. That's true. Depends now, on your lens. now, does does this red pill that we're talking about, is it retroactive? And for me, like in the last uh, six months, well, no, really since well, June, that's, that's when the McCarrick stuff hit. Uh, I'm now looking back into time to other appointments, other cardinals, like you said, like going back to Daniels and looking back even into Benedict the 16th, John Paul II, mm-hmm. John Paul once that much, but Paul the Six, And I'm just going back and just thinking about, is there a culture of clericalism, as we're now calling it, that has infected the church? And, and Tim and I have done a lot of videos looking at the plague and the priesthood of homosexuality, Bella Dodd, what Fulton Sheen said, Our Lady of Fatima. Seems that the 1900s, this isn't something that just popped out in 2018. Uh, this has been systemic. It's going all the way back. So either of you all pass the mic. Is this a, a retroactive red pill? And are you starting to connect more and more dots? 
For me, yes. When I look at um, just through the lens of the West, I grew up in uh, the East Coast of Canada and the Canadian bishops uh, in September of 1968 uh, wrote a response to Humana Vitae. It's called the Winnipeg Statement. I cover this in my book, The Contraception Deception. Now, it didn't have full Episcopal unity. It was a, like a committee, something that, that a, the committee of bishops kind of burped out. And number 26 of that document is the money line where it, the bishops essentially say couples that try to live up to the norms of this new encyclical and they sincerely give it their best shot can dissent in good conscience. They can depart from it in good conscience. Well, that became a truck sized hole that everybody used to justify their own contraception. Uh, that mm-hmm. document has never been formally repudiated, although the bishops, as the John Paul II priests became Pope Benedict bishops, they have definitely been more, as a group, uh, much more faithful to the, to the tradition with respect to birth control. But then you look at uh, the United States and Cardinal Jean Jadot, he was the, the nuncio. He gave us people like Rembert Weekland and uh, Joseph Bernadine of Chicago. Now, these are leaders of the homosexual collective. And Paul VI, actually, St. Paul VI, uh, felt the need to publicly say he's not a homosexual, which I don't think was a, a good move from an optics point of view, at least. It's like, why would you even? <laughs> so there's definitely, when you, when you retro look back at, at church history in the last 50 years, you can see a kind of softening of the ground. Um, if, you, if you look up any homily, do a Lexus Nexus search of any homily of uh, Venerable Pius XII and compare it to Pope Francis, it's almost like a different religion being expressed. Uh, in 1951, I'll give you a quick example. In 1951, just to contrast with the rabbit comment on large families, uh, Pius XII gave a talk to the Association of Large Italian Families. You can find it online. It's beautiful. He talks about the, the silvery voices of children, you know, ringing off the walls of the home keeps all mothers of, of large families young, young looking and beautiful. Just the most, just beautiful, gorgeous. Even if you're not Catholic, that is a, a, a robust defense of generosity to fertility. And then something happened at or before or during the Second Vatican Council. There was like a rapprochement with the world. We no longer thought of the world as the fallen world, the realm of the devil, the realm of error and death. But now this, it's, it's like the world got a reboot. And now the world is good because God made the world. So there's a kind of ambiguity there, which slowly, depending on who's in charge, right, became weaponized. Uh, Bishop Sheen wrote about this. Bishop Sheen is really quite the prophet for our time. He was saying as early as 1972, Catholic parents, if you want your kid to lose their faith, send them to a Catholic com- uh, campus. If I, you want- I just quoted this to... Uh- in my personal life to someone who's, who's right. not believing in Catholic homeschooling. Yeah. That, that exact line. Yeah. Send them to a secular campus. That that's where they're going to fight for the faith. Wrong. Yeah. And yeah. It, so his words about the laity, essentially priests and bishops are not going to clean it up. It has to be the baptized laity. And it's funny, isn't it? Here we are three, three laymen trying to do what we can to uh, affect the macro by explaining things in the micro to our sphere of influence. I can't change the, I can't change Pope Francis. I can't, I can't change my dog scout, but well, I have a shot of the guy in the mirror. It's an example of, uh, you know, Vatican II fathers, careful what you wish for, baby, because you wanted it to be the heir of the laity. And when you get the laity speaking, you know, um, un- informally, not from the pulpit, you get guys that might um, end up sort of taking the criticism to the streets, which is what's happening, which is what's happening with our show, with your show, with, with, with lots of different people around. I mean, look at one Peter five or life site news. You, you get that kind of stuff. Church militant. You want it. You got it. That's that's the, the irony of, of Vatican II. This is if this is the era of the laity, then um, beware. I feel a little bit like uh, Brady Bunch because because when you're talking and of course, I agree with both of what you guys are saying, we're all nodding, kind of looking up at the uh, at the frames, you know. But one thing I wanted to point out, I I, I sort of just thought of this. There's there's a a, a coterminous term with respect to the red pill. There's also the the blue pill. And and a couple of things you said, Pat, made me think of this. We we tend to talk about red pilling whoever brought this great, great term back from uh, the matrix. It's gotten really popular. We use it all the time. We, we talk about red pilling 
on the Pope as if it's a phenomenon that that uh, is a pertinent strictly to the woke, as they say uh, in the cities and being woke and whether or not you're 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 woke or you're unwoke. Uh, these are the only two categories. Well, there's this other category, blue pilling, right, which is people that are starting to 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 wake up that that willfully choose to go back to sleep. If you remember the first Matrix movie, so so uh, Morpheus offers Neo both a red pill and a, a, a blue pill. Most of the movies I quote from I've seen a hundred times. I've only seen this one a couple times, but I remember this the other day, and I'm thinking, what is the what is the extended metaphor here to be made? Right with with blue pilling, like. Um, we were talking about the kind of timeline, right, with with Francis and, and when things were becoming more and more painfully evident that I think both of you said something is wrong with the Pope. I would say a great many some things are wrong with the Pope. Shouldn't be learning what coprophagia is from the Holy Father or uh, or, or, or many of the, the concepts that he's made reference to. How to how to slay your enemy rhetorically. That shouldn't always be something you learn from the Holy Father. Many, many things are wrong. There, there has, there's been a blue pill moment that many have taken. I'm thinking about specifically the contraception thing reminded me of Feb, it was February, late February of 2016. It was before Amoris came out uh, by a month and a half. And we are waiting for the apostolic constitution. We already knew it was going to be a train wreck because both of those synods had been effectually shadow synods. They were they were hatching plots uh, by nightfall at my old institution, the Greg, and uh, changing the rules on the synod father at the second synod in 2015. And they were all lamenting this. And it became really, really, really clear sometime between extraordinary synod 2014 and ordinary synod 2015 to me. Um, and that's when I started publishing on it was sometime in, in late 2014 after the close of the first one. But anyway, um, it was early 2016 and something funny happened. It was on, I think, Chris O'Bear's show. Um, he made uh, the, the Holy Father made that Zika virus comment on a plane of uh, a plane presser. He said, uh, you know, basically now and he cited Pope Paul the sixth and he miscited him. He cited uh, Benedict the 16th and he miscited him. And he said, well, basically, it's OK for for, you know, to use contraception in cases in South America where they're worried about the Zika virus. And um, and so there was, I have to say, kind of a blue pill thing happening on um, Chris O'Bear's show, whose who show I listened to at the time. There are lots of good stuff there. And I called in. I was like, I can't take this anymore. I, I can't stand no more. Right. And I was I was going to get my my eldest daughter her medicine. And I was listening to it on my car and I was like, all right, I'm going to call him. And, you know, you hear when you go in, I turned off the car, but the show went to the earphones and I was talking to his producer and I was like, hey, you know, I, I know Chris a little bit. Um, you know, I write I write for Catholic Answers magazine. So um, you got to listen to me like the This is not. What he'd said before going to commercial break was, uh, in essence, that this was spin, that it's not verified. And what had just happened, I was checking on my phone as I walked, was Greg Burke had said, yeah, the, the Pope meant contraception and specifically he meant condoms. Right. So they're going on and on um, on the Chris O'Bear show about, oh, you know, conspiracy theorists are saying that he's saying contraception is OK. And I was like, no, dude, you, you have to tell him. This is really, I mean, they just released, he, he, he meant it. They've doubled down, quadrupled down. They, they even named the forms of artificial contraception. You, you got it. You're, you're embarrassing yourself, right? Like you got it. You got to do something. So then he's like, all right, I'll tell him. So I, I went, stood at the pharmacy window, ran back to my car. And I'll never forget, Chris O'Bear had Patrick Madrid on the phone. And, um, and they were like, acting like, so, you know, the, the, the sky had fallen. And I was like, this is, this is just more of the same from my perspective. And they were like, okay, okay. They're admitting it. They're like, yeah, this, this news just broke that, that, that Greg Burke, you know, Vatican mouthpiece said, you know, it was artificial contraception. They even specified like, what do we do now? And I just thought, 
you know, guys, this, this is nothing new after, after two synods, you know? Um, and you know, I mean, you know, in a sense, I think they were being woke right then they were red pilling right then. And I'm not sure where they went from there, but, but 2016 was even pretty late. What, what did you, I, I've never talked to either of you guys about that. For me, if I hadn't been such an, such an untrusting bastard to that point, right. Then that probably would have been my, do you guys remember that? February 2016, Zika. Yeah, I oh, do. Yeah. yeah, because what got invoked was something that never happened. And that's the nuns I know. In the Congo scenario. There were nuns in the Congo. And they were never told by Paul VI it's okay to, uh, you know, insert IUDs or go on the pill because you're going to be raped by Cossacks of, of the, you know, African kind. That never happened. That's just something that someone pulled out of thin air. I've talked to Janet Smith about this. No one can find the historicity behind that tale. And here, Pope Francis is invoking it again. Uh, interesting, uh, Tim, the, the blue pill thing, it reminds me, and, and, you know, the red pill, blue pill, but then just sort of shutting down. You notice a lot of the Pope's defenders have just kind of gone dark. Right, right. right. How do you accommodate this? It reminds me of the phrase fight or flight. You've all heard that, right? In the face of grave danger, you, there's fight or flight. But there's a third one. It's fight or fight or freeze. And I think there's a lot of frozen Catholics out there. You call them the frozen chosen. They just don't, they don't want to come out of their cocoon and say anything because they think that saying something that casts aspersions on the Holy Father is deeply insulting and a scandal to other people. And this is, was part of my red pilling itself. Right. I criticize the Pope. Am I being a bad Catholic? Because I'm preventing souls from coming to the fullness of Christ. And for a while I thought, yeah, <clears throat> there's this terrible scruple against saying anything against, I mean, it's the vicar of Christ on earth, the sovereign pontiff. I mean, I grew up having a great instinctive reverence for that office. So when the man occupying the office is, is not living up to its expectations, who's departing every other day from the, from the terra firma of the Catholic faith. Um, and I, after a while, I just, I just stopped doing it. And it's funny, you, you guys have probably felt this waves of affirmation from people that, that surprised me. Patrick, thank you for speaking up. Your boldness is contagious. And this is where I'm at now. And I'll give you a little analogy here. You know who Douglas Murray is? He's an openly gay British conservative. He's written a, a lot about the invasion of uh, England from uh, primarily Muslims, Muslim um, immigration. And same with someone like Tommy Robinson, who's a lot more kind of street fighter fighting uh, political correctness and, and warning the English and uh, UK people in general of what Islam really stands for. Douglas says, and this, this applies to Pope Francis, there'll be an act of Muslim terror. And the example he uses is Lee Rigby. Remember the policeman who was decapitated in, in, on broad, in broad daylight? Yeah. When, when I or anyone in the press describes that as an act of Muslim terror, we get attacked. We're divisive, we're fear mongering. So the secondary reporter is suddenly the source of the scandal, not the scandal he's merely pointing out. So there's something analogous here with Pope Francis. If I say that the Pope is, is unusually unclear as a teacher, I get you know, called a Pope hater, a Francis hater. Yeah. Wait a second, is what I'm saying true or not? And like you, Taylor, I've, I've slowly seen that some of people that I would consider more on the traditional side than I am, who seem just nonstop complaining, whether it's LifeSite News or Raticelli or, or Michael Voris, how many of their prognostications have been vindicated? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so now I just, I'm just breathing different air. And I, I, I can say, truthfully, I love Pope Francis. He's on my rosary every day. I pray for him Me every day. Me too. Day. Pray for him on the rosary every day. I, I do not want him to, to <laughs> fail. I want him to succeed. I'm actually, call me naive enough or just pathologically nice because I'm Canadian. I think it's not too late that he can actually come to some moment of clarity and, and stop being an innovator and start being a messenger. As long as I'm fine with that, as long as you're not praying for the Pope's intentions, then, then we have problems because I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure you yeah. get, got to be converted first. Yeah. I don't know what they are. So my mind goes on mute. I'm just teasing. Yeah. 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 What does he intend? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. I, yeah. I have an idea, but that, that we can, we can do that later. One of the All things right. that's, that's really interesting as people red pill 
is the phenomenon of social media. Never in the history of Catholicism has a lay person been able to directly address their bishop, archbishop, cardinal instantly at any time. Yep. For example, someone can go right now and address Cardinal Tobin on Twitter right this instant, and he can see it, or Supich, yep. or Bishop Strickland, or anyone. It's all out there. And yep. so the bishops who tend to be older who, from a previous generation, they are not yet savvy to this. And it's, it's almost, it's sad and humorous to watch them bumble through the whole thing. Here's a great example. The USCCB meeting last week was a total disaster, right? The Pope blocked the vote. Another, everyone's just, how, how could the Pope do this? Um, we were told to wait till November. Now we have to wait till February. They put up a resolution to ask the Holy See. It was just a paper resolution. It wasn't going to happen. Asking the Holy Father to release documents on Pope Francis, or sorry, on McCarrick. It was voted down. The very same day, they're sending out tweets asking for money for the Catholic campaign for human development. And it is brutal. You go in there, hundreds of comments. Nope, no way. Y'all are liars. Y'all are thieves. Y'all are pederasts. Y'all cover each other. And it's, I went through them. I, Patrick, I think there was 150 when I looked at it. and I just scrolled them. I was like, is there anybody positive? Zero positive. Yeah. 150 scorchers from people saying, you guys are lying to us. You're cheating us. No more. Not one more red cent. Not more, one more red cent was the number one comment, probably 40 times in there. Makes people you wonder are ticked. And they can talk back to them now and say, no more. Yeah, I've gone uh, back and forth. Bishop, I won't name over a coverage that uh, Raymond Arroyo is providing over on EWTN. Uh, Raymond's, I think he's consumed a five pound red pill. <laughs> yes, yes. Not sure what time his uh, said pill consumption happened. Early, early. Well, did, re remember his his coverage of even that first synod. It was he he red pilled early. He was one of he was one of the early ones. And, and at EWTN, no less. His coverage of the I had a couple guys that would gather around the the TV every Thursday night on when World Over would premiere. We were we were paying attention to the first synod beforehand we were reading the the synod notes and we'd, we'd kind of go over this line by line and then arroyo would come on and like man that guy is he's mainstream but he he red pilled early yeah and and for him to be attacked as biased and a shill for something or he's now becoming the secondary target is what he's saying true you look at a father uh, gerald murphy excuse me gerald murray the Murray, yeah he's great he's just a i love him no nonsense guy Robert Royal, whom I've interviewed several times, uh, the papal posse. Yeah, it's, it's Raymond's definitely the rule proving exception inside the, the mother, if I can call it the respectfully, the mothership of, yeah. uh, EWT, for sure. Yeah. And yeah, and it makes you wonder, do they read Taylor? Do you think, do they read these uh, Twitter feeds? Can, can they see the outraged reaction of the people they're now expecting to donate? I think some of them do read it. And you can see that, you, Patrick, you, you and I, I don't want to go and name names, but we pretty much know, I, I know there's at least 10 or 15 who are pretty active on Twitter. So they're seeing it. Many mm -hmm. of them follow me. I don't know if they're reading me. I'm saying things. Greg Burke follows me. I mean, I know that they have to be aware of it. Maybe they're not reading every single one, but it seems to me that they're so disconnected. You know, there's someone at the campaign for human development who was told, hey, on Thursday, put out a tweet so we can get some money, but they don't. They're not connected with all the outrage of the USCCB meeting. So there's, it's a giant bureaucracy. Yeah. It, it's not organized. And it's just, it's, it's a fissure that's opened up and we're seeing the smoke of Satan. And it's just pouring out. People are yes. outraged. People are outraged. And we feel like we have, it's not a democracy. We can't vote. You know, it's not like every four years or so we get to vote on a new archbishop based on yeah. his, on his record. He's there till he's 75 or till the Pope accepts his resignation. So there's, we can not go to mass, drop out. That's not an option. If you're a faithful Catholic and believe in the Eucharist and the sacraments, you can stop giving to the institutional church. Uh, we've been saying, hey, you still got to give alms and support the church in some way, but maybe not the hierarchy right now to show. And then you can speak openly. You know, there's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's YouTube, there's all these means in which we can 
uh, raise our voice. And I think you, Tim, me, we are trying to red pill a generation of Catholics. And hopefully that's a response. I can't pick a new cardinal. I can't go to the conclave. Yeah. We're not ever going to be able to do that. But can we collectively, maybe the three of us, can we uh, wake up a million people, lay Catholics in the pew and say, yeah, yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm sick of this too. This doesn't make sense. From what I read in the Gospels, when I read it, older papal documents and councils, this is in contradiction to this. I don't see how this is in line with the teachings of Christ and his apostles. Do you guys remember in the summer of 2017 how freaking sassy Father Antonio Spadaro got? He was he was in the news like three weeks in a row for saying outrageous things. Um, there was a point in which, um, and this really drove home the the viability of the social media for me. He said something. He attacked church militant by name. This was in late July or early August of 20 summer of 2017. And I was like, that's it. I, I, I'd been the designated uh, open letter writer for a few uh, for any time church militant got attacked. I would I would help them, even though I'm not formally with the organization. I'm, I'm uh, friends with Boris. So I'd be like, hey, let me write him an open letter. So I wrote. But I was on vacation in Florida. Uh, I was actually visiting Ave Maria there, a uh, lovely campus in Florida. And I was like, hey, I, I got this. Spadario wrote them something at like 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It was a tweet. And so I, I just on my phone, I henpecked a letter to uh, open letter on behalf of Church Militant to Father Antonio Spadaro for attacking him. He called them. Um, they'd been called recently, not by Spadaro, a cyber militia. And uh and uh, and so I, I just wrote an open letter and I closed with a couple zingers. I was making fun of uh, his buddy, Cardinal Martinez's book, he Heal Me With Your Mouth. And I was like, heal us with your mouth, not by kissing, but by apology or something. And um, we, with they, they put it up like a half hour later. This all happened in the space of a couple hours. And then right away, right away, not not. Eight minutes after they put the article up, Spadaro said, uh, looks like we're going to have to heal some of the uh, the angry out there. And he put heal in in uh, quotes. I was like, you know, score. And they're registering. They're reading it, particularly if you're with, you know, a couple, you know, big names like Coffin or, or Marshall or or Boris. Um, so that that's what you call relevant. You know, when they're reading it within eight minutes, they're across the world, different time of the day. It's, it's powerful stuff. What, what we're true. trying to do is powerful stuff. This is another example of careful what you wish for. The very first document produced, it was March 1963 from the Second Vatican Council. It's a, it's a decree called Inter Marifica, and it's on the media. It's very short, and uh, it's, it's worth reading the number of times that the word should appears. Hmm. Journalists should. Journalists should. Oh, it's, it's astounding. Now, this is before Al Gore invented the Internet. Right. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. In, in Inter Marifica, the council fathers encouraged journalists to be truth tellers and to, you know, kind of not fight the man, but boldly go where where non truth tellers are afraid to go. Well, if you fast forward to oh, this is just occurring to me. The year before that, a guy by the name of Marshall McLuhan wrote a book called The Gutenberg Galaxy. In The Gutenberg Galaxy, he coins the phrase the global village. He coins the term surfing, which he meant to to quickly organize a massive amount of information. And he envisioned an electronic a kind of cloak around the world. He, he was very inarticulate. It obviously, didn't exist yet. But he's, he's predicting the Internet, essentially. Um, hmm. McClure, of course, became a Catholic in the 30s, thanks to the influence of a guy by the name of G.K. Chesterton. He was uh, he was from uh, Manitoba, but he taught for many years at the University of Toronto. And uh, he was a lot of millennials have never heard of this guy, but I think he's I think he's his insights back in the 60s and 70s are now coming to fruition. And he's the guy who coined the phrase, the medium is the message. So with the invention of the modem and a guy by the name of Matt Drudge, now we don't have to wait for Walter Cronkite to, to tell us what's going on. You, you and I, we, we become Walter Cronkites. We're the editors. We're the filter. And so. When the church begins to, to live at the speed of Twitter, the leadership, they can't keep hiding and they can't keep spinning because they responded to that minute and everyone can read the responses. Yes. 
this is all it's very providential, I think. Patrick, what do you think of the the recent announcement this past week that the Holy See is going to have a list of approved Catholic sources for news? Um, and also, I think it happened yesterday that NBC did a, a, a collaborative effort with the USCCB, the American bishops, um, with the, the fault of uh, digital stoning is what they're calling it. And they, they cited, I think, Church Militant, LifeSite News, and the Lepanto Institute as guilty of digital stoning and how this is destroying the church. They're clearly aware, they're aware of it, but their response is, let's go back to the index of forbidden books. We'll just make it online. Is that going to work? No, it's not going to work. One man's stoning is another man's describing. What you're talking about, this, you know, getting certified as an officially kosher uh, news outlet is the inverse opposite of what Jacob uh, Imam is trying to do with this red hat report. Um, Jacob is compiling pretty deep research into the cardinals who will vote in the next conclave. Because a lot of these guys do not know each other. They've never met. And some of them are oddball picks. You know, Pope Francis is, mm-hmm. it, takes someone who's like-minded, the same cast from a remote Tongan island, you know, and all of a sudden <laughs> he's a voting member of the, of the cardinals. So it's ironic that the people who feel threatened by Orthodox Catholicism suddenly want to certify people when in fact the lady want the voting cardinals to be certified, certified as Catholic in, in, in outlook and in commitment. No, this is this is just life in the gulag. It's not going to work. I mean, um, how's it going to go if it says uh, Church Militant and Patrick Coffin Nation and Taylor Marshall are contraband? What does that mean? Like, if we put out a, a video that has a, something critical about Cardinal World that were excommunicated, or um, it's a sin for lay people to click on our link? I mean, how do, what does that mean? Well, that will not square with the teaching of Intermerifica. It will not square with what every pope since the Second Vatican Council has said about communications. This, their world communications is about leveraging the, the, the means of communications and telling the truth. Um, it's also not going to square with what the pope himself said in his flight back from Dublin to Rome. Remember when he, when he shook his finger and said regarding uh, the Archbishop Vigano letters, yes. I will not say one word. And then he kind of turned to the journalists and half challenged them to do their jobs and find the truth of things. That's what I'm trying to do. This is an answer to a papal call to action. So you can't square that with trying to decertify. I mean, what is the church now? Twitter, where, where Jack Dorsey can just, you know, uh, shadow ban you and delete your account. People who are, who are paying attention are going to see through this as an example of, of Big Brother, in this case, <laughs> Big Father, Big yeah. Eminence, Squash, the little guy who's simply trying to understand the world as it is and tell the truth about it. Yeah. Arguably, uh, th- this is just a... a- a friendly list of suggested suggested fellow travelers, right? I mean, because I mean, I think even for the likes of uh, the, the Peronist Pope, who who might like this degree of discretion, actionable discretion, you know, they, they they're not actually saying these sources are not Catholic in the same way that the printed word can be sort of excised from the official uh, codex, right? So I. Yeah, when I heard that, I just thought, um, who's going to be number one on the suggested viewing? Will it be uh, Coffin or Marshall, right? Where, where do you think you'll take your place? Is it a badge of list? honor? Yeah, is it a badge right. of honor at some point? Yeah, will the feather in my cap be liturgically correct color-wise? You know, how does that sure, uh, which and would, matters now. Yeah. yeah. And would St. Catherine of Siena made it to the, would she be considered kosher or uh, a pariah for confronting the Pope of the, the Avignon papacy? Right. Yeah, the list goes on of, of church people in church history in those situations. I want to go back, Patrick, to the not one word. That yep. was a major red pill moment for many, many people. It, it went to, you know, some, some people that I, I talk with online, you, Tim, others, to suddenly everyone in the narthex after mass saying, did you hear what the Pope just said? Yeah. Because they heard about, v, they heard about McCarrick. They're like, what's going on? Then they heard Vigano. And then everyone's like, okay, well, the Pope's going to speak not one word. It's still been not one word. Well, except for his homilies almost every day at Santa Marta. Uh, what was your reaction to that? Uh, this is intolerable. That was my reaction. Yeah. He could have said, 
uh, I do commentary every month on this and uh, the Coffin Report. And I, I found the transcript of what the Pope said. Two questions after that. Two questions after that, a journalist asks him about parents of homosexual children. What do you do? And one of the things the Pope said was, well, silence is not a strategy. You have to have dialogue. You have to, you know, dig in and have frank conversations. And he said that uh, psychiatrists can help if there are disturbing, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, disturbing signs, right, of either homosexuality or transgenderism. Again, he was ambiguous. The official Vatican.va transcript excised all references to what the Pope said about homosexuality and psychiatry in the same sentence. And I thought to myself, silence is or is not a strategy. If it's not a strategy for a gay child, then it's not a strategy with respect to Archbishop Vigano. He could have said, Archbishop Vigano is a known liar. We're going to do, we're going to cover this. I feel sorry for him. He's not telling the truth. He's, he's compromised, whatever. Or answer the objections because Archbishop Vigano to me is like a, a, a latter day St. Athanasius to, for yes. the guy who's so embedded in the Death Star, whose, whose whole ecclesial career has been a company man faithfully serving the Holy Fathers and, and the church, pouring out his life, for him to call for the Pope to resign, and then for the Pope to say, not one word. It just speaks volumes. doesn't matter whether you're Catholic or not Catholic. It's like, fathers don't stay silent when there's a crisis like this that could be solved. To me, Taylor, it was like, um, I was already red-pilled by that point. I thought, how, how much worse can it get? But it reminded me of the uh, Doobie Brothers sequel. Just an extension of that silence. So look, I want I want to I want to take a moment and 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 push in in this direction because you guys both laughed when I said don't careful if you're praying for the the Holy Father's intentions. I mean, intentions aren't all that inscrutable a thing, particularly when we consider the confluence of that that perverse you know in flight presser where he said I'm not going to say one word, a and b the complicity. The, the complicit silence of the worldwide media. He, he was, to borrow one of these stupid leftist neologisms you hear on MSNBC, he was using a, a kind of a dog whistle without much uh, uh, artifice or, or subtlety. He's using a pretty obvious dog whistle and the, the lap dogs came running to it. And I mean, if you look at what's transpired over the last three months, I, I mean, his intentions are really clear. His his intentions in in as a sort of uh, of a piece with the the global left, right? I I don't think I don't think I'm out on a limb here. I mean, you look at the things that this pontificate stands for, the Francis pontificate, and it's when people say it's a train wreck, it's like, oh man, uh, I aspire for it to be a train wreck. It's so much worse, you know. I mean, it and this pontificate aspires so to a train wreck. Sorry, go on, Pat. No, I was that, that's an insult of train wrecks everywhere. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. I, I tra- and that makes a train wreck look uh, orderly, right? The, the second law of thermodynamics being what it is. So, I, I mean, this is where I, I make this comment even to um, fellow red pillars after mass. And they'll go, oh, you know, about oh, don't p- don't pray for the pope's intentions. Well, if, I mean, this is all sort of one thought, isn't it? If If this did not happen by accident. I mean, we were talking about the the St. Gallen Mafia, what the what the um, pontificate stood for, the fact that that Cardinal Casper in the 80s was trying under JP2 what he tried under Francis and JP2, you know, sort of shut it down. He kept elevating uh, Cardinal Casper, of course, kept going higher and higher, but he did shut down the specific policy directive of getting communion for the civilly divorced or remarried. But um. Boy, I mean, you, you look back, the, 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 the last five years, five and a half years sweeps over you. And it's it's quite I mean, it's a hell of a thing that's happened in the span of half a decade is. I mean, what is the agenda of the, the Francis pontificate? I, 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 there have been a few documents that have come out where where he, he's basically said what it is. Yeah. Why? Why? I, I guess I guess I'm defending the proposition that that people people tell you their priorities by the pocketbook. People tell you their priorities by their action, and they tell you that by what they what they vote for. And like you said, Pat, 
who their friends are, right? Personnel is policy. I, I don't think it's as inscrutable as I guess you guys do or even other red pillars do. Yeah, I guess I'm just out of the discernment game when it comes to what he, his words versus his intentions. Just so much to be said about what you just said, uh, Tim. Can I, can I just for the sake, I don't want to uh, barnstorm here, but just open it up a little bit for people who don't know who the Sengallon Mafia is. It's a very, it's a key, it's a key piece here. So for people who are just stumbling upon uh, your show, uh, maybe give the compressed version. What is the Sengallon Mafia and why is it important? To know? We have, we can do it, but uh, Tim and I did like an hour and a half show on St. Gallon Mafia. Is it oh. okay if we just link it? We'll just link it in the top right corner. Perfect we have problem. an hour and a half, it's either an hour, hour and a half detailed yeah. person by person St. Gallon Mafia, where it came from, who was in it, what they did. Every It's basically a conspiracy of bishops and cardinals who met in St. Gallen, Switzerland, and conspired basically to get rid of Ratzinger, Pope Ben XVI, and put in a new person, a Jesuit pope, who would be favorable to liberation theology and changing sexual morality in the church. Pri prior to the 20, 2004 conclave, that's Correct. the really... That's yeah. the real uh, oddity here when people think, oh, yeah, yeah, they were. So they wanted to get rid of France. No, they actually wanted to get rid of Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, CDF, right? Pre prefect for the CDF before anyone knew who uh, who this archbishop from Buenos Aires was. They were saying back in 1996, the likes of Cardinal Martini uh, and, and some of the others we've mentioned here, uh, the worst guys in the church. Yes. Yes. They were yeah. saying, look, there's one guy for us. You don't even know who he is yet. He's not even a cardinal. He's just this archbishop. But he is who we want instead of the favored presumptive uh, pope, who is the CDF in the last declining you know, decade of, of JP2's life. That's what that's what really staggers people. They stopped meeting after ben, you know, after Ratzinger became Benedict the 16th. And somehow it took them two con conclaves, but they got the job done. But I mean, go back and read it. It says creepy, creepy stuff. Like there's only one guy that that fits our agenda. That's that's extreme enough to fit our agenda. This is wild stuff. And when you use the word conspiracy, Taylor, you have people have to understand this is not a conspiracy theory. This right. is a conspiracy practice. It's been objectively verified in two books that I know of. I mean, here's 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 the size of my red pill. I interviewed Bishop Emeritus Rene Henry Gracida of Corpus Christi, who's written a letter to the to the uh, cardinals, an open letter, asking them to revisit the, the March 2013 papal conclave because there are irregularities. That if that's true, that means the election itself is invalid, which means we've had a longer interregnum than we thought we did, and that's a you know that's considered a controversial yeah, position. That's a black pill. Read the. Yeah, that's, I guess it's a black pill. Yeah. Um, Philip Lawler, whom I've interviewed twice. Now, this Philip Lawler is a guy who's been writing about the Catholic faith and culture for 30 years, a very detailed, balanced journalist. He's very fact-based. And he, in the first year of the, of the Francis Papacy, he wrote a book, co-wrote a book. I think it was called Called to Serve, kind of praising the fresh uh, approach of the Pope and all the, all the hopes that most of us had. And then he wrote Lost Shepherd, how Pope Francis is misleading his flock, in which he says, this is a subversive papacy. As you say, Tim, this is a deliberate attempt at subverting Catholic teaching and making it into leftist talking points. It reminds me of something Father Newhouse, the editor of uh, First Things, he called the USCCB the Democrat Party at prayer. And that was back in that. the early 2000s. Yeah, maybe even before that. Yeah. yeah. So... Yeah, I'd like to return but, to that if you don't mind, Patrick. You want to talk about American bishops, or do you have another point you want to pr pr go with? Well, just that the USCCB is not—it's not an authoritative teaching body. National mm -hmm. conferences are not doctrinally binding on the faithful, uh, and we know this because Cardinal Ratzinger explained it as a prefect of the CDF. So when you have these—I mean, they—they they seem to crank out documents every other week on migrants and climate change and handguns uh, but that's the point uh, yeah. all these like lightweight stuff in light of what's happening as rome burns to put your focus on things that are prudentially debatable or or otherwise a bad idea is just not a good policy yeah. and so bishops in union with the pope 
enjoy the charism of infallibility. I know you've covered this a lot better than I have and more, um, Taylor. So what the bishops say collectively is not binding on the faithful. Um, I wanted to bring up something that, because we're talking, it, people listening now may be thinking, hey, these guys are riding a pendulum to the right or something. Yeah. They're, you know, they're focusing on, the, on all the negative. I've heard people say in, in response to this crisis, our hope is in Jesus Christ alone. We're Catholics, we're the original Christians, so our, our hope is founded on Christ alone. Sounds admirable, but it's not accurate. We are, that's Protestantism. We don't believe in Christ alone. We, in fact, you could say Catholicism is, is allergic to the sola idea. It's Christ and his church. This is why this crisis is so painful, because right. finally, the bride faithfully expect, expressed the truths of the groom. But now the vi- it's like the bride has a, a serious virus. She's sick. It's, laid, it's sick. It's laid up in bed. That's why it hurts so much. This is why right. I'm wincing my way through all of this, because... Uh, we don't believe in Christ alone. Christ has a, has a, he has a living vicar on earth. That's meant to faithfully transmit the deposit of faith, which is. I div- yeah. Sorry. I, I divide this into three eras in salvation history in my church history class, right? The, the entire old Testament, basically up until the birth of, of Christ is the era of the father, uh, you know, the God, the father, and then Christ's life, the span of years there, the incarnation, 33 years, is the era of the Son, right? When he's, he's taking all that translated uh, Old Testament and, and incarnating it. And then from, you, know, you kind of have a little interregnum between Jesus' death and the Pentecost, or they don't really know what to do. But then starting at the Pentecost, the, the birthday of the church, this is the the onset of the third era of salvation history, the era of the Holy Spirit, who likes surprises, we're told. He doesn't like surprises as much as we've been told, perhaps. But the Holy Spirit, unlike God, who acted directly on his own behalf, the Father, with the Jews, unlike Jesus, who spoke directly on his own behalf in his 33 incarnated years, the Holy Spirit acts basically exclusively in and through his church, right, in and through the, the magisterium. And that's why, to, to just to add a little bit of fuel to the fire, what you're saying, Pat, that's why it's not as simple as just saying, yeah, well, our, our, our faith is in Jesus alone, you know. Hey, look, this would be much simpler if we were among the 12 apostles who walked with, sweated with, ate with, you know, rested with, with Jesus roaming from town to town in Galilee it would be much simpler. You don't need a church then, and you don't need bishops, right? The bishops, when they were hanging out with, with, with our Lord, were literally just kind of gophers. They would go get his bagels, bagels and cream cheese. So they didn't have to do anything. It was only at Pentecost that they got a charge. And it's like, now you're the apostles, you become bishops, you have to do something. What you do in terms of historicity really began mattering at Pentecost because now our Lord is acting uh, through his Holy Spirit through through you. So, yeah, it's it's not the same deal. Things things would be drastically different. And you, you get a lot of this. I think it's spillover from Protestantism that 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 critique. I think you you even said that. And this is how I teach it, too. This is why the church matters so very much. It wouldn't matter. It's fair to say this. It wouldn't matter so much if Jesus were still embodied down here below with us. Uh, it matters a lot more since he's back up at the right hand of his father in heaven, right? I think people need to be told these things. The thoughts need to be made explicit that like, no, the church matters because Jesus is back up in heaven. Yeah, when I mean, we weren't left orphans. Right. Uh, I, I just, I would add the words and yet to what you just said so well, Tim, and that is, and yet, in this generation, there are some outsiders who are behaving like insiders, people like Jordan B. Peterson. I think I'm the only person who have interviewed him four times. Uh, ben Shapiro, um, uh, Dave Rubin. There are people who are not Catholic who yet seem to work with an anthropology that's very pro-Catholic, that are red-pilling people outside the official strictures of the church. Just reminds me of the saying of St. Augustine, right, that God, God has bound himself to the sacraments, but is not bound by them. And you right. see 
spirit, you know, this wild bird, uh, you know, <laughs> where's he going to go? Who, who knows? He's totally sovereign, totally free. And he can touch people outside the, the ways in which we've traditionally thought are his preferred ways because the, <laughs> the bride is sick, right? Has a virus. Wouldn't it be fantastic if, you know, of course, none of the three of us agree with everything Peterson says, but wouldn't it be amazing if we had a bishop who was out there saying the kind of uh, enlightening philosophical things about manhood, about anthropology, uh, about our meaning in life, all these things that he's saying, and, and he's kind of re reverse red pilling our secular culture and, yeah. and, and giving it back that sacramental power. Yeah. Where are the bishops in this? You know, I, I kind of want to turn us a little bit here back to the bishops. Are we going to see a moment in the next year or five years where the bishops start taking the red pill? Because right now, I mean, there's not, there's Athanasius Snyder, there's Cardinal Burke, uh, Brand Mueller, you know, we're, we see a few of them coming up at this UCCB meeting. But right now, it's like you said, there's all the, everyone was just pumped over Pope Francis and all the bishops in Year of Mercy. And some of them have gone quiet. But it seems like the majority of the Catholic bishops here in America are still Team Francis, promote everything he does, apologize or defend everything he does. Are we going to see a shift or are we on our own as lay people? I, back to what we were saying earlier about boldness being contagious. I've been following uh, Bishop Joseph Strickland pretty closely of Tyler, Texas. Very small. Awesome. Docs. And he's really, uh, he's you know, our neighbor to the South, Texas, uh, he's really, uh, kind of like Yosemite Sam. He's just sh shooting from the hip, but it's all accurate. It's all, it's, it strikes me as manly and clear and fatherly and, and fearless. You mentioned, uh, Brand Muller and Athanasius Snyder and, and Cardinal Burke. They're all on no, no fly zones. They've yeah. been down effectively by, by the apparatchiks in Rome. And so other prelates, they're looking, Right. It's like the, the sibling, uh, kids in a large family. If the father becomes abusive and starts shellacking ones who, who get out of line, that has a, a that instills fear. And so the more bishops that speak out without fear and not part of the USCCB um, structures, you know, the, all that bureaucracy and all that red tape and all the careerism that goes along with it. I think we can see more bishops speaking up. Uh, the only thing I can conclude from the vote where they, uh, what was it, Taylor? Two thirds voting down. Two thirds move... voted down. Let us ask the Holy See for a soon release. Okay. Well, I have to presume point, that's. It's around 0.6666%. Are Not you that that means anything? 666. Mm -hmm. Is that what going here? No. Uh, I think a lot of the bishops are a part of that. 70s, 60s era of the Rembert Weekland, Bernadine Mahoney axis that a lot of the bishops are compromised by homosexuality, yeah. either themselves or being and the behold, chancery, the seminaries who ordained them and to whom they feel some loyalty. I just think they're they're locked up because the look homosexuality be, provides a magnificent uh, avenue or occasion of blackmail. And so if you have no control of your appetites, you become very manageable in that way. Yeah. It darkens the intellect. Yeah. So, you, so do you think there's hope or not for the bishops? I do. I think there's, I think there's hope for individual bishops to speak right. up and to see their roles in light of, here's another irony. If you read the Second Vatican Council docu document, Christus Dominus, on the role and the call of bishops, man, who on earth could live up to that? It is a very bracing read. It's not very long. It's one of the uh, kind of unknown documents of Vatican II. If bishops see their role as in an organic and supernatural connection with the victor of Christ, I think they can find their, their fighting legs mm -hmm. and get away from the U USCCB um, entrapments and just see their role as spiritual fathers in union with the Holy Father. I think if, if bishops have a chance, it's, it's by following that path and away from bureaucracy and more into evangelization. Yeah, it's been said, you know, a man becomes a bishop when someone from the Holy See calls and says, hey, Monsignor Coffin, we'd like you to become the bishop of Rapid Cities. Do you accept? And he says, yes. It's been said that in the past year, more and more men being called are saying, no, there's no way to verify this. But I think, 
you know, priests who are out there who are faithful, who may even be, be tapped. They're like, I don't want to join <laughs> at this moment in history. I don't want to be at the USCCB. I don't want to wear a minor right now. Well, kind of going back to the early church where men were running away, running from the cathedral to avoid being consecrated a bishop. Isn't that sad? Because they could, they could have a shot at being part of the solution. Right. But this is the general spirit, isn't it? I mean, this is what we talk about almost every show, uh, Taylor, you and I, is the idea that people, these, these young men, or I guess middle-aged men, which counts as young, if you're talking about going into the CCB, they don't have the fighting spirit, right? Which is kind of attractive to me. I mean, it's not, it's not going to be fun to go and to be a rogue minority voice on behalf of our Lord, but it's at least what, what men are wired for, right? Manliness, the, you know, the holy fight, you know, the, the manly virtues as they used to be called right in the late Roman Republic. Why is this not more attractive to, to priests that entered the, I don't know how you could go through pretty much any seminary in North America and not feel like, okay, if I'm going to do the right thing here, it's not going to be popular. Uh, yeah, but the, the, guy who, the guy who thinks that was weeded out first year of seminary, we're being told. I yeah. guess that's what it is. So, it, but, but I mean, so that yeah. means it's not just a problem with the, with the curia. It's not just a problem with the episcopate. It's a problem with, you know, priests, which, you know, I buy that, but w- you know what that means that the long-term solution isn't with the personnel we have right now. They're the wrong guys for the wrong time. What we need is to, in some new way, I believe this is the true evangelization, the old evangelization, is to make attractive to young men the fight, right? Like, look, you're going to have to go in and fight. Prepare for it. Go to seminary like you're going to battle. And um, you're going to have to, you might have to yell. I mean, go, go read your, your patristic fathers. But Tim, I've, been, you know, be I've, I've, I've taught seminarians. Uh, those guys don't make it through eight years in some seminaries, there are seminaries where those guys do make it through, but I would say 51% of the seminaries in America, that guy who says, well, why is the nun standing up at the altar? Or, uh, why did we, why are we using a, a, a gender free translation of the script lections, the scripture readings, any seminary who's asking those questions along the way is booted out. He is carefully yeah. weeded out. So by the time he becomes a priest and then a pastor and then later on, those guys with the fight in them are either never made it through seminary or they're like out in the sticks beyond the suburbs in a small parish. That's part so of the problem. It's, it's part of the problem. So the locus in quo for the hope, j- just so we're being specific, the locus in quo for the hope, if that's the case. Not the case everywhere. Not the case everywhere. But in the majority or more, if that's the preponderance of the cases, because it's just a bunch of aggregated individual cases, then what, yeah, what's the source of the hope of what we're really talking about? Hate to talk about it in crass, you know, um, you know, populist terms uh, like the ballot box or something. But we do what the church needs is a retaking of the majority in the positions of power. How, how is that ever to happen if, if that's the case? That's what people really want to hear. That's what I was going to say. Michael Rose is another one of these guys that was derided and written off. But when, when, when did Goodbye Good Men come out? Mid-90s? I think that's the 90s, yeah. And so, yeah, well, his thesis, he, he was attacked for not being scientific and rigorous. Well, anecdotal evidence that's so widespread is better than no evidence at all. And I think his thesis has been vindicated uh, many times over. Uh, it goes back to uh, you're, yes, aggregated bunch of individuals, Tim. If more seminary rectors have that fighting spirit, they're going to be seeking out fighting seminarians who are willing, like they are, to be mentored in how to go against the grain. Over time, Taylor's absolutely right. I've, I've known a lot of guys going through seminary. I was in a, a pre seminary program in Ottawa, and I know how someone who walks in the door with that gloves off, fighting for Christ, attitude slowly gets domesticated. Someone puts their arm around them and says, look, don't complain that the chalice is plastic. Okay. Just think about ordination. Uh, and now there's some, they there's call a, it, they call it just, they call it don't holla till you get your collar. That's what they, okay. that's what it's called. Yeah. 
And I've, I've met great priests, I mean, uh, great seminarians who are, go- I met them in Rome, godly guys. And they're like, Dr. Marshall, what do I do? The nun at the seminary says, we can't read in the mass unless we use uh, gender-free pronouns. Should I read or not? I say, you don't read, man. Yeah. You know, like, well, then he's like, well, then what, then what happens? Well, then the, it's like, at some point, you kind of wonder, are these places like Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, are they going to dry up on vocations? I kind of think that that's the Holy Spirit's way. They have dried up. Yeah. Los Angeles is the largest sea in the country. There's a small trickle of guys entering. Look at, uh, compare Los Angeles to Little Lincoln, Nebraska. Yeah. Study in contrast. And, and hey. if, if you've been neutered for your entire seminary life, are you going to have any vocal cords to holler after you get the collar? I say yeah. maybe not. The collar. The holla after you get the collar. Holla after you get the collar. So you got to spell that, it. Right? That's one of the things. Yeah. Like you, you're a seminarian. You say, well, I'll speak up against abuse when I'm a priest. And then you become a priest. You say, well, I'll speak up when I'm a pastor. And then when yeah. you're a pastor, you say, I'll speak up when I'm a monsignor. And then I'll speak up when I'm a bishop. And then you're a bishop. I'll speak up when I'm an archbishop, <laughs> a cardinal. Okay. Like, by the time that happens, you've been neutered. Which is the, the manly the virtue has eroded away. The chronology of s- subsidiarity. See, when 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 Catholics talk about this this you know foremost social teaching of the church, subsidiarity, they always talk about it just spatially. There's this whole temporal component of it as well, where we have to add. And this is what I'm always talking about. With I just want to see an organic fight. That's what young men are built for. You don't wait and you don't wait at the dictate of of what is prudent or what is charitable. I'm sick of all these bywords that excuse cowardice. When you see injustice happening, you act right. You just say this is this is a bunch of crap. No, like and and you start yelling at whoever's nearby. So when when people are asking us, what do we do? It's just don't sit through abuses, right? You might have to just tell, tell your priest off if he's, if he's doing uh, liturgical abuses. You might have, sorry, like, and again, it is a function of the prudence, so you have to do it in real time. We not only are called to act in our immediate sphere of influence, that, that proximity which immediately envelops us, our home and neighborhood, but you're supposed to do so in your time, and, and your time, like my time, is always, it's not the past, or the future, it's always the present. Don't wait to do this stuff, or else you'll just kick the can down the road. And you'll keep making an excuse. You'll keep procrastinating when to to grow a pair. To be uh, to use the French expression, right? Hey, could I could I pause there? I I'm gonna pull a Tico Brahe. I drank two cups of coffee. I have to run to the restroom. Is like cool? Do it. Do yeah. it. Then have a bladder explosion. I think you should manfully, you know, persevere. I I do not accept your uh, just go, part. man. Just go. Yeah. Yeah, just go like I'm dumb and dumb. Yeah, yeah, go right yeah, where I'm at. Yeah. It's warm. Hey, Patrick uh, and I are wearing depends. Yeah. And speaking of talking to your your priests, your fathers directly uh, in a way that's clear and, you know, uh, unambiguous. I was thinking as we were talking in the last hour about this crisis, that really it's a crisis of fatherhood. Bishops and priests are not they don't come to us at, from, a you know, planet Zorkon or out of uh, in a void. They are raised in the same kinds of families that everyone else is raised in. And look at the crisis of masculinity in the culture. Men have been, have been uh, uh, neutered. Leon Podles has a great book about this called The Church Impotent, The Feminization of Christianity. We, we've likened Jesus to Mr. Rogers or Barney, where, where the goal of a Christian man is just to be a nice guy. Put on that cardigan. Um, you know, everything's domesticated. There's no danger. Christ is, is it's not dangerous anymore. Christ is dangerous. If you, if you read Matthew's account of, the, of the, the calling of the apostles, he walks on the shore. There's, there's the sons of Zebedee, right? With, the, with their father. Jesus says, come follow me. And the Bible says they drop their nets and leave their father. And we know they were close with their father. So Christ represents a high adventure that the adventure of what they're already enjoying can't quite compete with, and they're willing to follow him. I, I like the, the old joke about uh, men will cook if danger is involved, which is why barbecues exist. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I think that our, our, our priests and bishops leaders are also products of our, our screwed up culture with respect to the definition. Now, the very definition of what it means to be a man versus a woman. Now that Facebook 
has told us there are 71 options for gender. Mm-hmm. You know, a good yeah. example of that is, is Bishop Strickland from Tyler, who we were just talking about. Yeah. Um, I talked to him on the phone not too long ago, and I, it was a great conversation. Like, this is a great bishop. This is before the USCCB and all that. And so I just Googled, you know, Bishop Strickland, and a video popped up. And he's at, he's with a, there's a bunch of young men, youth, and he's challenging them to a push up contest. And he's on the ground going after it, you know, trying to beat these teenage boys. Like, that's really cool. You know, like he, he's not an ivory tower. He's not soft. He's not effeminate. He's, he's doing what a dad would do. Like I do that with my sons. Like, you think you can get 50 on me? You think we can go 50 right now? Let's do 50 push ups, And we go at it and then we rib each other. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Almost, that's great. That's manly, you know, and, and as, that's just an as anecdote. As long as he got near 50. Yeah, that's, that's I think good. He did. As long as it wasn't like 15. Actually, I think he yeah. beat the kid. Anyway, okay. I mean, it's just an anecdote to show, you know, we talked about Strickland and orthodoxy and, and calling a spade a spade. And then we also see fatherhood there. We see paternity. I see that in Bishop Thomas Paprocki as well, Springfield, Illinois, who's a, a marathoner and a hockey goalie. I remember his introductory press conference, he started it this way. That's what kind of put him on my, on my radar. I've since interviewed him. He said, uh, gentlemen, I'm used to, uh, getting hit with 90 mile an hour pucks with that. I'll take your questions. <laughs> I love it. And he's another guy who's, who's got the gloves off pretty much. And who, who will, great. will never get the purple hat. <laughs> Probably. You mean the red hat? Well, the purple hat first, right? Oh, you said he's a father or a bishop? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, red. <laughs> okay. Red. Are you red colorblind, yeah. Patrick? Okay. <laughs> red. Uh, 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 <laughs> what was your name again? Yeah. Yeah. Red hat. But that's fine. He can, he can bloom where he's planted, and he can draw young men to himself as a mentor and as a father figure. Oh. Young men are looking for that high standard, a standard that they maybe, maybe they doubt they can reach for and even get. That's what lights up. Precisely. Uh, see as, as priests you know do you think he and supich uh play hockey in in a friendly spirit oh good question uh in in illinois they answer that here uh no i don't i, I probably not 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 of the cut of the same cloth you know where else we've seen that is vegano the language and the diction and and the way he phrases his writing it's about salvation it's about hell it's about my conscience not freeing me from responsibility but burdening me to do yeah. something that kind of language we haven't heard a whole lot from the, spell, the higher ups of the, of the Catholic hierarchy. The third letter to me is the one that, that is the, it's a really golden every paragraph. And I the, look, my context is I grew up admiring Cardinal Willett. He was the, the uh, kind of protege in the mold of St. John Paul II running the church in, in crazy secularist Quebec. He was attacked all the time. He just seemed to have a spine and I always admired his leadership. And his response to the Archbishop Vigano letter was very hard to read. It was very difficult. I, I winced my way through it um, because he validated everything. The central points of Archbishop Vigano's letter were verified. However, ironically or, or unintended, um, it happened. But the four last things. When was the last time you heard a, an Archbishop talking about death, judgment, heaven, hell? That's yeah, awesome. And the brevity of life. It's like, bring on more. I want to hear more yeah. of that. I think the last the last member of the Episcopate or Cardinalate that I heard talking about that is uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, right? When he mentions the four novissimi as uh, CDF, when I, I I don't hear cardinals or bishops talking about those four last things. Uh, literally, it's it's that rare in the seventies, eighties, nineties, two thousand era. Yeah, right. I mean, literally, literally, I think that's the last reference in like 1984 by one of them up until Vigano said that, you know, one other point I wanted to add. Mm-hmm. I think this gets overlooked a lot is in the secular culture, what what's lent, it's a little bit counterintuitive. What I believe is lent to the absconding of fathers, which is uh, Pope Benedict's term, right? The era of uh, absconding fathers is a weird secular phenomenon of, of parent worship, right? That, that started in, in America, I, I've studied this a bit, started in the post-World War II generation, right? With the, the worshipfulness of the elders, um, which Jesus really challenges in, in, you know, in the gospels. He challenges that, that Judaica 
of worshiping your father. Right. He, you know, he says, of course, all those famous lines about, you know, he who does not hate his, his parents or is not able to challenge his parents. Um, there are other places in the new Testament where he is very, very, uh, critical of this Judaic model of parent worship. It also seems to have played a role in the latter half of the 20th century and, and produced the kind of, um, I don't know, response in the hippie generation. So I feel like there's a, a strange pairing of the the lack of accountability of fathers to their sons uh, in the culture at large that you even will hear baby boomers who maybe were ex hippies saying, Oh, well, you know, my parents did this wrong. My parents were, my dad was an alcoholic, my dad, but you know, Hey, he fought in this war. He was gristled. He fought in world war II. He fought in Korea. And it's like, no, what's key in keeping fathers honest. Um, I think we tend to talk about it is, is the critical role of the wife. It's really the critical role of the sons, which is, has, it's been all but lost. It's unique to Christianity. The Eastern religions don't have it. They're very elder worshiping. The Greco-Roman pagans <clears throat> worshipped fathers. The Jews were very father worshiping. Christianity, one of the sui generis aspects of it is how much we're invited. And I'm not just talking as, uh, you know, one of the members of the cardinalate to the Holy Father. I mean, at, at all strata within Christian society, it's like, look, fathers have to be accountable. The The catechism of the Catholic Church says parents should show lead their kids in reconciling by apologizing severally and often. So, yeah, I just, I think this is a really important aspect of, of this conversation that gets overlooked a lot is you don't, you don't, we don't want to conflate to elder worship. The father should in a sense, justify himself to his kids. And, uh, and well, it, it seems all but lost. I see an echo of what you're saying in pop culture and TV shows in the fifties. Like, Father Knows Best with Robert, uh, Robert Young, uh, the Donna Reed show, where the, the pater familias is sort of the, the terra firma and the last say. But then you have the sexual revolution hits and the silly 60s arrive. And soon after, you have a TV show that can never be shown today, impossible, all in the family, where the father is the object of derision. And yet he, Archie Bunker was given all the great lines. You can see this battle between Archie Bunker and Meathead, who represents that that hippie generation where it's all free love and, and uh, conservative values are, are to be sniffed at. That's important. But so what, what I really think happened generally, cause I, I love, I love generational studies. Sounds like a bad major at a NYU or something, but I, I love the study of the way the generations interplay, how, how the so-called greatest generation, I don't know how they rested that title for themselves, kind of like the enlightenment self build, right. In a very flattering way. The way they interplayed with with the baby boomers, the, their offspring, seems to have been because I'm not saying father doesn't know best. I mean, we're, we're the priests of the households, but it seems to have been in a waspish uh, way where just father knows best. And he's never he never justifies himself. He never says, look, son, I, I you know, I was wrong. I, I needed to you know, I, I was wrong here. I'm the final authority in the family, just like the papa, the prima papa, you know, the pope. Only he can call himself out, right? Because because father does know best. But I think what was happening a lot in in greatest generation is father knows best. This just means he's never wrong. And you get the kind of ultra Montanism, pardon the expression, that that the hippies in the boomers really reacted adversely to, but in the wrong way. And they 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 took all vestiges of authority. And they said, well, this is this is what we don't like. We don't like authority. They became egalitarian, all, all the nonsense. They, they took issue with all social structures. It's like, no, no, no. This this pyramidal social structure is right, but it's got to be what does St. Paul say? He's got to be he's got to be the man on top, a moral man. He's got to lead his family and apology and 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 coming to Jesus. I, I just think it's really I think it's the central issue in the absconding of fathers is the defense, the hyper sensitive, thin skin defense among some Catholics toward Pope Francis, an example of true uh, uh, ultramontanism, or is it papalatry? I, I, I just see it's both, it. right? Or well, is, mean, ultra, is ultramontanism a form of papalatry, which is what I'm kind yeah. of coming to realize myself? Well, if you have, yeah. if you have, let's say in the era of Pope St. Pius X, and you've got modernist 
uh, sort of like evil crocuses popping up through the snow of the church. And you, you've got Catholics in, in more remote areas, like let's say Ireland, uh, Father Tyrell, some of the um, turn of the century modernist leaders. This is, these, are all, these are the godfathers of the modern descent movement. You had Catholics who were locally trying to squash them and trying to appeal to Rome uh, for clarity, knowing that Rome would give them clarity. Hence, they were tagged ultra, ultra Montanists, you know. But that's different from what we have now, because now uh, appeals to uh, clarity are laughable. Clarity is exactly what you will not get if you appeal to Rome now. That's right. Sure. Yeah. Patrick, can I, I, I want to wrap this up and I want to talk about Coffin Nation and what's going yeah. on with Coffin Nation in a little bit. But one last question, and people have asked me to ask you this question. So here's your zinger, okay? Oh. Uh, with Catholic Answers and your history in Catholic Answers, there's always what we would call tradies or traditionalists calling in from in various stripes. And some people have seen you as somewhat over-defensive uh, against, against traditional-ism, if you want to call it that. Has being red-pilled opened you up to being interested in the Latin Mass? Um, that point of view, uh, has your position on Vatican II been notched down at all? I'm just curious about where you stand on that post red pill. Very good question. Fair enough. Uh, Tim Staples and I did two shows on what we called radical traditionalism. And most of the audience reaction to that was positive. And we, they're glad that we went there by radical traditionalism. Uh, I certainly I can't speak for Tim, but I was talking about SSPX, SSPV, more Catholic than the Pope. P Catholics whose whole life, their whole wheelhouse is to be against something. And whether it's John Paul II or Pope Benedict, there was always, it's like a bitch fest. And I, I thought to myself, these pompous Latin titled websites, there's a small army of them. Like, who are they trying to evangelize? Who are they trying to convert? It's like an echo chamber of bitterness. And um, I've, I was very glad when Samoran Pontificum came out. I've always been interested in the Latin mass, even when I was, you know, struggling to find my way back to the church. I'm very friendly with the S, uh, F S S P. Um, we used to go to the Latin mass from time to time in San Diego, but the, it was just too far. So it became a function of, of geography. Um, I've always appreciated what I would say. I would say the, the, uh, public witness of many trad families that are large, that you, if, if you're going to go to a, a pro-life activist meeting or um, uh, be seen outside of Planned Parenthood, there's going to be Latin mass goers there. They're like the spine of the church. Mm. So I was never trying to cast aspersions on trad Catholics per se, because I, I think they're a good metric of, this, of the health of the church. Even if you don't go to the Latin mass at all, you have to be appreciative of what Pope Benedict did for to make the Latin mass um, up to the pastor without having to sign off from the bishop. And this is why I think the bitterness set in. They felt, look, we're we're representing continuity with things that happened before, oh, 1962. And why are we being sidelined and shamed and quarantined? I, I always sympathize with with that. So I, I've never been anti-traditionalist. What I have been is constitutionally allergic to any adjectives. I just want to be Catholic. Right. I want to be yeah. Catholic, Jesus yeah. Christ. And I want to be able to answer the question. I'm Catholic because so when you adjectifies your Catholic faith, whether it's traditionalist, conservative, even orthodox, to me, it's like a tautology. A Catholic is a Catholic, of course. good one, a bad one. And in, in a previous generation, the bad one said, yeah, I'm a bad Catholic. This is why people <laughs> like Monopolis, my guest this week, as we tape this on the Patrick Coffin show, he knows he's a bad Catholic. He makes no bones about it, that he's not, he's, he's divided. He's inwardly conflicted. Uh, unlike uh, other people who want to do the, you know, uh, personally opposed but nonsense version that we got from, from Father Drynan and from Cuomo and now Pelosi and Biden and, and all, all the rest. And so that's a long winded way of saying I've never been opposed to the Latin Mass. And uh, I what I have noticed as my red pill experiences proceeded apace, I came to a greater simpatico with the the. the rationale for their complaints yeah fair enough and yeah I, me too I'm, I'm just kind of the longer <clears> this goes on the more and more interested i get in 
the Latin Mass traditional seminary formation. Like I'm, I'm thinking, okay, things are really messed up. Let's go back to 62, whatever, and just, and just study it. Look yeah, at I'm, it seriously because we are off the track. So we need to, we need to go back at least not too far and look at how seminarians were formed, how priests were ordained, how liturgy was done, et cetera, to try to gain some sanity back. Yeah, and I, I, I take great delight in introducing Catholics to the other 22 councils that came before Vatican II, I think ecumenical councils. Like, did the church get invented in 1962? What, is, this, is, is everything new good, you know? Um, I, I'm going to be interviewing Bass Roten. Bass is a, a MMA. Oh, I've got him on my list to interview. All of fame. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Fighter. So, so Bas prays in Latin. Yes. Uh, you know, Latin is the mother tongue of the church. It's the Latin, uh, it's the language used in the rite of exorcism. So I think he has a salty way of putting it. I, I pray in Latin because it pisses off the devil. Kind of the language of his destruction. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I think we're going to see more and more younger Catholics interested in the uh, in the traditional Latin Mass, the extraordinary form, which is the way I prefer to refer to it. So, Patrick, tell us what's going on with Coffin Nation. Yeah, Coffin Nation was uh, launched last summer, uh, thanks to my my gloriously talented wife Mariella, with whom I could not have done this. It's uh, it's an uh, international online community of culture builders, and we have three levels of engagement: basic, premium, and ambassador. And you get the full video iteration of my show, which is now heard by God's grace in over 100 countries. It's a closed Facebook group. It's a monthly live webinar called Ask Away Thursday, where we talk about issues that arose from, from the show, from the guests, from the topics there, and also stuff in the news that most people, they don't have a forum or a wheelhouse to discuss things, like with Pope Francis or with, with Trump, and the interplay between faith and politics and culture and all that. I also do a masterclass interview with an influencer. It's called Transform You. I've interviewed uh, Jordan Peterson on his self-authoring suite, David Allen, who wrote a book that really changed my life called Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity, Ken Davis, who's a, an expert trainer in public speaking. He's the co-founder of SCORE. If you've read Michael Hyatt's book, uh, um, Platform, Platform, Michael and Ken founded the SCORE. I highly recommend it. In fact, we're planning on doing a Catholic-only leaders conference for public speaking for seminarians, priests, bishops podcasters, everybody who wants to take their game to the next notch as public speakers. Phenomenal. I learned a ton uh, <clears throat> from SCORE. This month's Transform You guest is Alexandra Havard, who's a, a Catholic leadership expert in virtuous leadership. And uh, he has a book out on the, the four classic Greek temperaments and how they need to be domesticated, and how the weakness that comes along with the strength needs to be fortified. So um, this is all it's all part of coffination.com. And we only open the doors twice a year. And the reason I only open the doors twice a year is that I don't want to be spending my time doing sales and marketing. I want to be giving the wow factor to my members. And so um, this, the Monday after this Christmas, excuse me, this Thanksgiving, so the 26th of November, midnight Pacific time, the doors close. So if you go to coffination.com, you can watch the trailer, you can find out more. And I'd love to see listeners of the T Marsh T Gord show and sign up and become legal citizens of Coffin Nation. Awesome. Well, great. So it's coffination.com. Yep. All yes, right. sir. Everybody go sign up, get involved in the restoration of Western culture, Christian culture. Are there, are there any benefits for illegal mem citizens or non citizens? We, if we catch you, and if you, if you storm the wall, you don't get the swag cup, the Patrick okay. Coffin. All right, good. You still get health care there. Okay. Okay. Still got it. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, thanks for everybody for watching. Uh, again, please like and subscribe this video. When you like it, that tells all the bots at YouTube this is a cool video and it shows to other people. When you subscribe, you get notified whenever we put out more videos so you know when the next video is. Thanks, everybody, for watching. God bless. Pray the rosary. Stay in the Catholic Church. Stay faithful. Don't lose your cool. Till next time, be salty.